Fighting crime means prevention, it means rehabilitation, and we also want to focus, as we are today, on, uh, on reentry. Um, as I said, we're never going to be uh, anything less than vigilant against, um, against crime, but like you, uh, we all firmly believe that our country has a, has a broad obligation to support those who work hard to break free of the cycle of poverty, crime, and incarceration. And that's why I'm, I'm personally committed as are my colleagues, to amplifying and expanding upon the outstanding work of the champions who we're honoring here this afternoon. Now, nowhere is this commitment more clear than in the Justice Department's Smart on Crime initiative, which I announced last August, and in the work of our Federal Interagency Reentry Council, which brings together cabinet members. And this is not something where deputy secretaries are welcome. I mean, this is something where cabinet heads come together. Uh, and other leaders throughout the Obama administration, in which I'm very proud to chair. Uh, these groundbreaking efforts are enabling us to tear down unnecessary barriers to opportunity and independence while building upon programs and policies that enable returning individuals to successfully reintegrate into their communities. Now, as a, as a critical part of this work, through the Department's National Institute of Justice, We've funded the American Bar Association's efforts to create a national inventory of collateral consequences of conviction. Now, this inventory can be searched by state, it can be searched by consequence type, and by triggering offense category. And it is modeled in part after the collateral consequences assessment tool, which was pioneered in North Carolina by one of the champions that we honor today, Darrell Atkinson. Now, Darrell overcame his own involvement with the criminal justice system and has since worked to build a, a better future, not only for himself, but for countless others who deserve a second chance. Thanks to the tireless dedication of attorneys and staff at the ABA and the commitment of people like, like Darrell, our collateral consequences inventory is now complete. And it catalogs an astounding 45,000 45,000 federal and state statutes and regulations that limit opportunities, 75% of which are employment related. So think about that in terms of collateral consequences of conviction. 45,000 federal, state uh, statutes and regulations and 75% of that 45,000 are employment related. As we speak, the department is encouraging states to eliminate this staggering number of legal barriers that, that do not serve a public safety purpose. And to that end, I've asked state attorneys general to reconsider policies that impose overly burdensome obstacles on formerly incarcerated individuals. And now I invite you to join me in recognizing our 2014 champions of change whom it is my privilege to introduce at this time. To Harold Atkinson from Garner, North Carolina, an attorney at the Southern Coalition for Social Justice, focusing on criminal justice reform issues and a founding member of the North Carolina Second Chance Alliance. Both you know, tell your story and how you came to be such a fierce criminal justice advocate, um, but also tell us a bit about the sort of uh, culture shift that you envision. Sure. Um, I, I don't have a, a book like Tracy, not yet anyway. So I guess I can, I guess I can reveal a little bit of, uh, more about my story. Uh, in 1996, I was convicted of a first-time nonviolent drug crime. Uh, I consider myself a casualty of America's ill-conceived, immoral, and highly racialized drug war. Mm -hmm. And out of that experience, And out of that experience, I was given a 10-year sentence. I served a mandatory 40 months on that 10-year sentence. I had a high school diploma. When I went into the Department of Corrections in Alabama, I had a high school diploma. When I left, the state of Alabama was nearly as progressive as many other states that you heard folks talk about on the various panels with regards to offering post-secondary educational opportunities. You couldn't even take correspondence courses. Uh, fortunately enough for me, I was released to a, a loving family. My mom is over there uh, that could provide me food, clothing, and shelter, and I didn't have those immediate pressures pressing down upon me. But when I was released, I, I began to serve the second part of my punishment. My driver's license was automatically suspended because of my drug crime. I was denied federal financial student aid because of my drug crime for a term of years. I was denied admittance into numerous universities and several law schools, even though I graduated summa cum laude from my undergraduate institution. 
and I'm permanently disenfranchised in the state of Alabama. I will never vote again in the state of Alabama because I was convicted of a crime of moral turpitude. So we say that we want to welcome folks back, but then we set up a policy environment that makes that nearly impossible. So fortunate enough for me, I had that family that could provide me that support system. I was able to get my associate's degree, my bachelor's degree, my law degree. I'm licensed to practice law in Minnesota and North Carolina. And, 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 and that's common. People usually clap after that, but I don't, I don't tell that story for the applause or for the data boys. I tell that story just to illustrate the human capacity of the people who we're putting in cages every day in this country. I tell that story because, see, I don't have any delusions of grandeur that there's something oh so special about me. The only thing extraordinary about me is that I had extraordinary opportunities because I had a viable support system to wrap around me. Now, not everyone is going to have that kind of support system. Everyone isn't going to return to that kind of family and that kind of community. That's why convenings, that's why the work that the federal government, that's why the work that we do in the respective states is so important so we can create secondary support systems so more folks can be successful. So why am I such a fierce advocate? Because I got skin in the game. I mean, this has directly impacted my life. And we really need to facilitate the leadership development of people who are most intimately affected by the problem and put them at the center of the solution. When you look at any movement, movements are led by the folks most intimately affected by the problem. So you need to get formerly incarcerated folks. You need to get folks with conviction histories. You need to get their families at the table to find out the solution. So, for example, look, we, 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 we talk about these analogies, and a doctor, for example, goes through years of training. He learns the anatomy. He learns how to administer drugs. He goes to school for all of that time, and then he goes and does a residency where he then learns even more about how to care for a patient. What's the first thing the doctor asks you when you come into his facility? What's wrong? What's wrong? America is sick. We have 5% of the world's population, but 25% of the world's prisoners. Either, either we're the most morally depraved nation on the globe, as Senator Jim Webb said in that Parade Magazine article a few years back. Either we're the most morally depraved nation on the globe, or something's tragically wrong with our criminal justice system. So there's a sickness in our system, right? But we aren't going to ask the patient Right? The folks who have been closest to the problem, what's wrong? So we really need to get formerly incarcerated people, people with conviction histories, folks and their families at the center of the solution. And that requires a shift in culture. And that shift in culture is the language that we use when we use to describe these people. See, I'm not a, an offender. I'm not an ex-offender. That, that defines conduct, something that I did. That doesn't define who I am as a man. Yeah. I'm a father, I'm a husband, I'm a deacon in my church, and most importantly, I'm a, I'm a child of the Most High God. So I refuse to be defined by a single moment in time. So language, that's how we shift culture. The images that we put forth in our media, in our television, the, the bleed, if it bleeds, it leads kind of mentality that we have in this country with regards to sensationalizing people who might have done something wrong, right? And that represents such a small percentage of the folks who go through our criminal justice system. It isn't the vast majority. So the images that we put forth. And lastly, amplifying the voices of people who are closest to the problem so they can be at the center of the solution. And the perfect example is we've been given a lot of talk about ban the box today, right? We've talked about it in, on the various panels. You know who came up with that concept? A group of formerly incarcerated people called All of Us a Nun in the Bay Area because people who are at the center of the problem know what they need. They know their solutions. 